it's a it's a fun <clears throat> it's a fun honor and privilege to have Rachel be our main event tonight. Uh, that's a wrestling term, David. You, you didn't use main event, but thank you for referencing the wrestling pieces. Uh, this is her second time uh, in Omaha to speak in the past decade. Uh, we brought her in t when we honored Steve Rikus for our day of learning and laughter, and I hope we're in for some laughter tonight. Um, Amy and I have been a follower of uh, Rachel's work on TV for the past several years, but I really started to know about Rachel as she matured as a writer when she would contribute to the online journal called Tablet. Raise your hand if you've heard of Tablet magazine. Okay, if you haven't, you should go home, go to Tablet and Google or, or search uh, Rachel Schuchert in there. She's got some great pieces that'll lighten your spirit if you need it. Um, but I really, I, I think that it's a great tribute to her as a writer. Rachel, I have to tell you, your mom is a great source of information, okay? I don't know if anybody knows this, but Aviva loves her children. Not just Rachel, but also Ariel. And every Shabbat, uh, pre-COVID, you know, many of us would go to Bethel for Shabbat, and I would always ask Aviva, what are Rachel and Ariel up to these days? Uh, and uh, it wasn't hard getting information out of Aviva about uh, Rachel. Sorry if I'm embarrassing you, Aviva. Uh, let's just say that uh, I found out that she moved to LA. I found out that she had a baby, Theo. Uh, I learned that she worked on Supergirl. Anybody see Supergirl? Okay, uh, go home and Google that one. Uh, I learned that uh, she was working on a new show called Glow. David mentioned Glow. If you don't know what GLOW stands for, Glorious Ladies of Wrestling. There's a character, there's a character in there named Ruth from Omaha. So when I first started watching GLOW, I, I thought that uh, Rachel had um, put that character in there and from Omaha. I later learned that uh, it was done before Rachel was on the show. She might talk about that. Um, but since COVID has come on, I haven't been able to question Aviva about what Rachel is up to. So I had to do a little sleuthing. Not much, not difficult doing that because there's a lot of stuff online about Rachel. But there's a great uh, interview that she did that came out in Omaha Magazine back in April. So if you want to learn more about some of the work she's been doing since COVID started, uh, it's in there. She's written many books, Have You No Shame, Everything Is Going To Be Great, uh, Love Me, Starstruck, She's worked on TV shows such as Red Band Society, Supergirl, Glow, Babysitter's Club, and I learned from David tonight, Handmaid's Tale. I didn't know that one. Um, but Rachel is just a phenomenal person, and I'm thrilled that she's going to be with us tonight. I do want to share one quick thing. David kind of uh, took a little bit of my uh, talk with him that uh, I have a, um, an interest in the history of Omaha philanthropy. And we have a great resource called the Jewish Press. And every year from about 1919, the Jewish Press started in 1920, the Jewish Welfare Fund, later the Jewish Federation of Omaha, listed everybody who made a donation to the Jewish uh, community. And Rachel's great-grandfather, uh, Reverend Jake Schuchert, was listed in there. So were my two grandfathers, so was David's uh, great-grandfather, and I bet, looking out around this room tonight, that probably 75% of you have a relative that made a contribution in the early 1920s. And if you want to check on that, you just call me, and we will look into that. But really what I want to talk about is the legacy part, having Rachel here being the great-granddaughter of somebody who believed in our community. Rachel's back in our community, and I, and I hope that one day that... Uh, her grandchildren will go through the archives of the Jewish press and realize that she was our main speaker for the uh, annual campaign event. And with that, I'd like to welcome Rachel up and give us a little insight. So. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Alan, for that. I'm, I'm genuinely so honored to be here. And and kind of a little amazed <laughs> that this is happening. Um, it's not every day that you get to give a speech in literally the exact spot that your career in show business began. Um, mine began 
honestly, literally right here <laughs> on this edge of the stage um, at the Fidel Jewish Academy Hanukkah pageant. Um, I'm sort of hesitant to say the year, but I feel like this is the one audience where I really have no prayer of lying about my age. So um, it was, I think it was 1988. Uh, perhaps you were lucky enough to be at one of these performances over the years. Um, I'm sure these days, just given the state of this building and the community that they have a full set and a professional director and a cast of thousands, but back in my day when we were just a scrappy little upstart school in an ancient building filled with asbestos and there were only about 30 kids in the student body, we would all cluster in the middle of the stage um, like a choir for the duration of the performance. Each child was assigned a line and would have to leave the group to come to an upstage microphone to say the line. And this was, um, in many ways, a sort of performance art endurance experiment as pioneered by the avant-garde director, Robert Wilson, as the audience and performers alike would have to sit in silence for the amount of time it takes a small child to walk several feet in a straight line and get through a single memorized sentence. It was about half an hour each person, if memory serves. And the performers, visible to the audience the entire time, would stand absolutely still without breaking or fidgeting or laughing or crying or wetting their pants for the approximately 13-hour running time. <laughs> My line was the last to be delivered. I was supposed to say it at the microphone, and then all of the children would sing a farewell song in unison, holding... Well, I remember us holding lit candles, but I know that can't be right. They could not have given us lit candles, even in the 80s. <laughs> and then walk off two by two... And it would have been beautiful, like a sort of Hanukkah-themed version of that section of the Nutcracker with the little angels that come down the stage and over to the side, except um, no provision had been made for me to leave the stage after I had said my line. So as soon as everybody filed off to find their parents in the audience and go to the bathroom and get water and get a cookie and get everything that they needed, I was left on stage and not knowing what I was supposed to do. And and figuring that leaving a single ghostly mic on the stage alone as the disembodied phantom voices of singing children was probably not the note of warm family fun we were hoping to strike after the show. I just stood there and kept singing as everybody else stopped. <laughs> Afterwards, my family seemed awestruck and I couldn't figure out why. And later I would learn it was because I had somehow obliviously sung an entire song as a solo and everyone seemed to think it was planned. <laughs> My parents were beaming, incredulous that I'd managed to keep such a thing a surprise, although I was as surprised as anyone. <laughs> People kept coming up to me to tell me they didn't know I could sing, and honestly, I, I, I didn't either. <laughs> I uh, had never thought of myself as being particularly good at anything. I mean, I was an early reader, but it's a lot less impressive to read at a fourth grade level once you're actually in the fourth grade. And, uh, but what I do remember most about that night was how much I loved the praise. <laughs> I mean, if this was what a life in show business was all about, I was all in. <laughs> so I doubled down. Voice lessons, dance lessons, right here at the JCC in the old studio that I can still see and smell and remember everything about, right next to the interior entrance to the Rose Blumpkin home, where I would often pop over to visit my great-grandmother after class, poring over the audition notices in the World Herald in order to gain stage experience while cultivating especially the number one skill needed for a successful career in the arts and almost superhuman tolerance of personal rejection. Now, there's a thing that people always say in TV writers' rooms when a pitch or a story idea comes around again. And it's often inspired in the moment of the seeds of something that happened several episodes or even several seasons ago. Uh, when a sort of story or an idea just clicks into place in the heat of the moment and everyone goes, oh my God, it's almost like we planned it. <laughs> because that is what this period of my life has always seemed like to me. On the surface, I was learning the skills I thought would eventually assist me with a career in my chosen field. But what I was actually doing was something far more important that would hold me in good stead throughout my life and my career. I was learning to be part of a creative community. One of the best things about Omaha, and maybe the best thing, um, besides the part where, you know, as an Angelino currently looking for a new house, I often look up houses here on Redfin and then want to kill myself, <laughs> is, um, at least when I was growing up, that it was, it was large enough to support all kinds of artistic institutions, but it was small enough that those institutions and the professionals that direct and perform and teach in them are accessible to anybody that wants to be involved with them 
There's no barrier to entry here, no exorbitant ticket prices or impossible waiting lists for classes. You don't need an agent and a manager to get seen for a role in a local production. You can just show up. And this was invaluable to me as a kid. I used to keep playbills from shows I saw in town and I would pour over the cast list and mentally check off each person I had met or worked with or learned from. And it wasn't long before I felt like I knew everyone in town. Working artistic professionals who treated me with seriousness and respect, even though I was a child. And with each little check mark, I was feeling more and more enmeshed in a community and more enmeshed in a world that I desperately wanted to be a part of. And the template of being part of that community was the fact that I was already part of such a strong community here among the Jewish community. A place where I observed from the moment I was sentient that people had a sense of belonging and responsibility to one another that in many cases went back generations. And nowhere was that more clear than here at the JCC where you'd walk off down that extremely shiny brown hallway <laughs> covered in bricks, with the eyes of centuries staring at you. <laughs> um, going to ballet class in your little bun, and you could walk past your grandpa and his friends playing cards in the lounge, and you might run into a friend of your grandma's who would then give every detail of your interaction back to your grandma to report back to you and your parents. <laughs> um, and there's a view, I think, among many people, that community is a place of, a, a place of safety, a, a place of boundaries, where one doesn't have to stretch one's comfort zone too much um, or encounter people or ideas that might make them nervous or feel uh, uncomfortable. And for many, this can feel like a home that you never want to leave. And for others, it can feel stifling. But I would like to posit a different notion of community which is not just a safe place where everybody knows your name or a place where everyone has a predefined role to play or a place that eschews those that don't fit in or are unsatisfied with their lines as written, but as a place of creation. The first thing you hear in a creative environment, whether it's a TV writer's room or an acting class or an art class or anything like that, is that this is a safe space. There's no judgment here. Feel free to fail. Now, this isn't always true, <laughs> but the idea of it is important. That safety is the freedom that makes creativity possible. Because creativity is essential for communities. To survive, they don't necessarily have to expand or grow or, or spin out out of control, but they have to evolve. And evolution is an inherently creative act. It occurs only through our relations with others. You know, we've all been raised on the idea of the loner artist, the anti-hero who creates his works of genius, and yes, it's always a him, in a vacuum. But the thing about a vacuum is that it quickly runs out of air. I've worked on a bunch of TV shows now, many of which are tonally very different from one another, and people are often surprised at this. You know, Glow versus The Babysitter's Club versus the lighthearted fun of The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're big shifts. <laughs> And I say, yes, yes, it seems that way, certainly. But the thing is that I really write about one thing. I write about women with projects. <laughs> um, and whether that project is a TV wrestling show or the takedown of a misogynist totalitarian government that treats you as a sex slave or, you know, tweens building a babysitting business, they're all really the same thing. They're all about how a culture of caretaking and community and of being responsible to something larger than yourself is the only way you can really achieve anything. Um, I'd like to get back to the Babysitter's Club, and, and not just because it's, it's coming out on Netflix on October 11th, and I hope that you'll all watch it, because we could really use the numbers. <laughs> and this season is really, really good. <laughs> and it's full of Jews. Um, but because when we were starting to work on it, I was asked again and again in interviews and by executives and by people giving notes, even by the actors themselves, is this really realistic? Could girls this age pull something off like this in the present day? Um, and I reminded them that the Babysitter's Club was based on a work of fiction, but, <laughs> but when they continued to ask, I would say, you know, and continue to say, like, would anyone trust these girls to watch their kids when they're just kids themselves? I usually answered, you know, with something flippant because that's sort of the way that I do things and, you know, that I, I'll, I'll let any of them watch my kid. And that is true, but, you know, to be honest, I'll let pretty much anyone watch my kid. Um, that's just something that happens when mommy is 
is kind of a workaholic. <laughs> I mean, teamsters babysit my kid. <laughs> And, and he loves them because, you know, they give him ice cream bars and they let him sit in the truck and he gets to push all the buttons. <laughs> uh, um, but the reason that I knew it was realistic was because I grew up in a community that had taken me seriously when I was just a very intense little girl <laughs> with very big ideas who, when I showed up wanting to be an assistant teacher at a preschool or a teacher's assistant in ballet class or to act in a professional play, they were like, sure. <laughs> well, at first, I mean, they were like, um, do you actually have a ride to all of these rehearsals? But, but mostly they humored me. And because of that, I was left with the sense that I had something valuable to give the world, which is a feeling that has really never left me, even in dark times. And even as I've moved through worlds that are bigger and can be intimidating, I tell myself things that I learned in Omaha, and I also tell myself, as I did recently, something that a very powerful producer friend of mine said one, once when I was very nervous about something. Honey, the Emmys are just a trade show. <laughs> if you remember that, you don't have to be scared of anything. Because the great thing is that once you've learned how to seek out community and to find your place within it, you can do it anywhere. No matter how big the world may seem, you can always find a place for yourself. People in my industry often comment to me that I seem to know everyone. And there's a reason for this. I'm old. <laughs> but <laughs> it's also because growing up in Omaha, in these overlapping communities, I never really had a sense that there were people who were unknowable or inaccessible. I always just sort of assumed that anyone would talk to me, and <laughs> it served me tremendously well over the years. People, even very famous, scary people, are just people who are looking to emotionally connect, maybe now more than ever. And if you're a person who can connect, you can find community with anyone. The other day, I went to a baby shower for a friend, which was being held at a very famous director's house. Um, and I realized as I was driving over that this director is the first cousin of my therapist, who is also the therapist of my current boss. <laughs> and this was a lot. <laughs> and for a moment I thought, well, this is it. This is the moment that I have to move to Finland and raise my son as a Finn, because there is no escape from any of this. Everything is just Omaha. <laughs> where everyone knows everything about everyone, and the Jewish press can figure out your address no matter where you move. <laughs> and I told all this to the first person I saw when I got to the party, who was a friend that I like a lot and have worked with before, but also had to fire kind of recently. <laughs> and, uh, and she listened, which frankly was probably awkward for her. And then she said, well, you know, just embrace it. <laughs> You made it, this is Hollywood, you're in it. Um, and that's true. But I don't think I would be in it if I hadn't been part of the Omaha community first. Because what I know, standing up here on the same stage where it happened, that I would never have sung that song at the end of the Fidel Jewish Academy Hanukkah play if I hadn't been sure that everyone else was singing with me. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Now I'd like to invite Brian Nog up to do his chore of uh, getting us motivated to support our community. And he'll do it really well because he's a great public speaker. Come on, Brian. Thanks for coming out tonight, Rachel. That was an amazing speech. Um, I had memories as you were talking about, <coughs> about your time in JCC Productions. I think there's a number of people here that were involved in those productions. Uh, namely, Joni Jacobson was directing all these productions. And uh, I remember being in a play, I think called The Odd Potato with Rachel. And it was a play that I think I was made to do by my mother, but uh, it, it, was a, it was a good memory. And uh, you know, I, I think about that, you know, you think about the childhood memories when you're you're sitting in the crowd, and uh, you know Rachel brought up a lot of those good points. But um, 
I just love to hear what she said about creativity. I mean, we have the ability to be, to be creative in this community because we're big enough to make a difference, but we're also small enough where anyone can make a difference. So I think that's important. Um, so again, thanks for coming together tonight. Whether you are in this theater or in front of me or listening on Zoom, thanks for making this event a priority. Thanks to my fellow co-chairs of the event, of course, my wife, Jamie Nog, and Carrie and Brandon Tauber. The campaign co-chairs, Marty and Iris Ricks, and Shane and Jess Cohn, and the Federation staff for putting on a memorable event. Despite just being able to be physically together on a limited basis in the pandemic, we are still able to come together as a community, spiritually, philanthropically, in how we participate when we can, and in how we share and collaborate on a future vision and strategic plan to build and sustain a strong and vibrant Jewish community. We have strived. We have overachieved once again. We came together during the pandemic year and set a record for money raised in a campaign. We contributed $3,502,431 last year, which allowed us to provide 60,000 in COVID relief 74,000 for Jewish religious schools. Uh, we had 1,435 Nebraska students learn about the Holocaust through IHE's annual moral courage and essay competitions. And 275 monthly meal deliveries were made via junior senior outreach. These are just to name a few of the accomplishments. Year after year, we realized that we are each counted on to contribute what we can in order for our community to continue to be successful. Our annual campaign raises funds to support our local agencies, Israel, and our programming. Most of us struggled in our businesses and livelihoods during the pandemic year, but still found a need and a way to contribute money and our time to the Jewish community. We should be grateful, thankful, and proud of how we came through against these odds and how we now know that we can get through anything in this unique Jewish Omaha. We now have a JCC that is second to none. If you haven't checked out all that is new and improved at the JCC, I'm glad we got to see it tonight uh, before this, uh, sign up for a tour with, your, uh, with one of the Jewish Federation staff members. Look at the Steinberg JCC on the Steinberg Cooper Fellman campus. We have the Alan J. Levine Performing Arts Theater the Baker Family Leisure Pool, the Benjamin and Anna Wiseman Family Reception Room, the Blumkin Family Institute for Holocaust Education Learning Center. We have some new conference rooms. We have the renovated Phil Sokoloff Fitness Center. We have the Goldstein Family Aquatic Center, the Linda K. and Nelson Gordman Black Box Theater, the Marlene and Marty Steinberg Arts and Education Corridor, the Milton Mendel and Marcia Kleinberg Hall of History, the Penny Z. Davis, now called Early Learning Center, the Schlesinger Family Lobby, the Shirley and Leonard Goldstein Community Engagement Venue, and the Simon Family Performing Arts Academy. I don't love doing lists and speeches, but I think the, the benefactors and what has become here has to be recognized. You can tell that we now have a modern renovated facility to enjoy and be proud of. The honoring of Uncle Chuck Arnold this year brought back a ton of memories for me at the JCC as a kid through the Saturday night JCC sleepovers, Platte River sports camp, and even the 12 day JCC overnight camp. We hope our children will have the same kind of memories we had. Buildings themselves do not create strong Jewish communities, but enriching and exciting programs do. With the hope that COVID will subside soon, we have beautiful community space for programs for all ages. Your generosity will enable the Federation and its agencies to create and host these exciting programs and events. I have many memories at the Penny Z. Davis Early Learning Center. I recall the Friday morning Shabbats seeing our children singing with my mother, Ms. Patty, and in my early fatherhood days with Maura Carey Fingold. It was a sight to see and an amazing way to start a Friday. As a young father and as a community member, it was worth attending to observe our community's future. The Jewish Press, a weekly dose of pictures, people, and programming with enough current events to keep track 
of what is going on in Jewish Omaha, our country, and the Jewish world, whether in Chicago early on or expecting it in the mail or online these days. I have always found it a worthy endeavor as it keeps us unique and relevant to those who care about our community from all over the country. My family from out of town looks forward to seeing what is going on in Omaha. And I was told that Kansas City, Detroit, San Diego, and Tampa are among bigger communities that all don't have a consistent community news source like our Jewish press. I visited the Rose Blumpkin Jewish home regularly as I grew up, learning that the ultimate mitzvah is visiting the elderly and those that are ill. Residents love to see visitors, especially children, and those extra smiles and laughs are good medicine. I had many relatives who were there and the care they received was amazing. When I first moved back, the renovations were starting to take place. I made it a point to bring my young children to the town hall on Sunday afternoons to play on the kids area slides and to visit people we knew there. The Rose Blumpkin home is something to be proud of and we have to continue to contribute to maintain it. We want our children to have unique Jewish experiences that inspire and bridges the gap our ch from our children's bar mitzvahs and their Jew to their Jewish identity going into adulthood. Your contributions make these experiences at Jewish summer camps, Jewish youth group conventions, and Israel trips available to all who want to participate. As I have children in this age group now, I think about how the high school Jewish experiences will influence my children in their excitement about their Judaism. Why do we give to the Federation? We give because of the JCC, where we have a sense of involvement, our kids participate in camp, we swim and work out, and it is a beautiful place of comfort and community. We give because of the ELC, where our children discover Judaism in early classrooms and sang Hatikva on the way home. We give because of the Jewish press, our weekly dose of Jewish Omaha in pictures and text. We give because of the Rose Blumpkin home to care and enrich the elderly in our community as we have for generations. We give because there have been few times in the history of Jewish community where helping others in need has been more vital. Jewish family service continues to be an amazing resource for many of our neighbors who struggle to make ends meet. We give to the Institute of Holocaust Education, Holocaust Education, as we can continue educating our community to ensure the horrors of genocide never happen again. We give for the scholarships to enable children within our community to attend Jewish summer camps, youth groups, religious school, and secondary education. And, but we mostly give for you. So Jewish Omaha can continue to grow and thrive for generations to come. We are fortunate to be part of a community that has many amazing nonprofit organizations. There are also many generous donors in Omaha that support these organizations. These entities have much bigger bases than we do. As Jews, we want to support these other organizations in addition to our commitment to JFO, but we have to consider that if we don't prioritize JFO, who will? Uh, we were supposed to be outside, I laugh at this, we were supposed to be outside still with drinks, still with the cocktails, so I wrote a toast. <laughs> So let's pretend you have glasses and we're still enjoying the nice cocktails. Let's raise our glasses for a toast to our hospitable, participative, and overachieving community. Your generosity and participation are appreciated and you keep us going strong. We are big enough to, as I said before, we are big enough to make a difference with our campaigns as a whole, but we are also small enough where your ideas and initiatives can be presented and considered. You can move the needle in Jewish Omaha. Thanks for all you do. And, uh, and now I wanna give you the opportunity to pledge at this event, if, and if you're here or if you're online. An anonymous donor, as people have mentioned already, an anonymous donor will match any increase or new pledge up to $60,000 to the annual campaign before October 18th. Please make your gift now to double your impact and help us unlock this generous gift to our community. This will also help the campaign get off to an amazing start. 
thanks to our first challenge match of 2020 campaign event with Josh Molina, we saw the largest amount raised at a single event. During last year's JFNA's challenge match, we saw our generous local donors unlock an additional match from national donors. So uh, you were given out your card earlier. I'd like you to take that out and at least look at it. And there's a QR code, which looks just like that, that uh, amazingly, you can take out, just like you're taking a picture, take out, open your camera app and focus it on that symbol and it will unlock a, an app called Mobile Cause that will have a drop down and it will lead you into uh, getting information and your pledge. Uh, we'd, love, we'd love for you to do it right now. I know everybody's not going to do it right now, but we'd, we highly advise that this is a good time. You've, you've seen a lot of the you know, a lot of things to make you excited about what's coming forward, and uh, and we just appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks again for attending tonight, and everyone get home for safely. Okay, I'm going to call up uh, my friend David Galinsky back up for us to close out the night. While he's coming up, I just want to give a shout out to Jess Cohn for all the work that she's done to keep the staff sane while she led through some of the pivotal changes we needed to make. So, David, this is another great Put night. Put that QR code back up. Okay, we're gonna try something. That QR code, I'm not gonna try anything. You guys need to, you guys need to just do this. It works, it's amazing. Did you ever notice these QR codes, they look like a Rorschach test. So, look, if you don't, do you see the elephant in there? If you don't see the elephant in there, it's a dark world. You need to give. You need to make a difference. I just find that's really interesting. Well, I think you see a lot of space in there. There's space for I giving. Think there's space, yeah. I mean, it's negative space. Well, we we want, want to make, make, we we make, make it positive. Thank you. Yeah. I thought Rachel was amazing. Was she not amazing? I loved listening to her. She's all about community. I got three words for Rachel, and that's season three dad. I'm available. <laughs> Catherine and I raised two wonderful tweens. They were tweens at one time. So it's just something I'm putting myself out there. It's good that you offer it's, your services. It's up. possible, yeah. yeah. You're all, you're such a giving guy. I think tonight was amazing. I would encourage everybody to actually make a commitment tonight. You're going to do it anyway. Just get it out of the way. Why do you want it hanging on your desk, collecting dust, or run across it? I'm going to call you. <laughs> just do it. Put it in there. We'll make some numbers happen. We'll get all excited. Get the momentum going. What else do we need to talk about? Just that. Make the gift happen and support the community. I do want to say just how wonderful it is to see everybody again. And I just want to thank David, who's been a partner with many of the things that I've wanted to do over the years through the ADL or the Federation. And he's always there to take my call and to help out. It's and, my pleasure. And it's a great for me to have this honor with you tonight. Thank you. And thank you for it's, your service. It's been fun. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, staff with baskets that can pick up your pledge card if you have them. Thank you all.